with the help of two thumb screws, the case pivots off with these two, well, Good day folks, Jordan here today with another computer of all things. This one I actually picked up for free from the local senior center as they no longer needed it. This is a Gateway GT4024 from 2006 and uh, not really much to say about the front so uh, let's go ahead and uh, take off the side panel and get a closer look. With the help of two thumb screws, the side panel just pivots off and you have full access to the motherboard. Now this system actually does not have a SATA hard drive, which is interesting because by that point in 2006, you would have thought that SATA would have been a standardized form of internal I.O. for hard drives and optical drives. Well, maybe not necessarily optical drives at this point, but definitely hard drives to speed up access time, which is very interesting. But this system actually shares the exact same motherboard as my E2600S gateway, which, if you don't know, is effectively a thin but tall business class desktop which used the exact same motherboard. In fact, this is a BTX motherboard and you can get a good look as to the BTX style form factor. Effectively, what BTX was trying to do at the time was to make a more efficient cooling design. As you can see, the CPU sits right here on this end of the motherboard and the way this works is cold air comes in through the front of the case, is blown past the CPU by a big fan and is effectively exhausted out the back. And a lot of system manufacturers at the time, especially Dell with their 700 series Optiplex and the GX620, this actually didn't get too terribly popular, but it did see a little bit of use. Of course, we know ATX today, which was introduced in the 1990s. This tried to be another form factor, but of course it didn't quite catch on, but it did see a fair bit of use with these OEM style systems and some off-brand, of course, they got like Pete Go BTX and so on and so forth, but we're not going to get into that today. Of course, the star of the show is the Intel Pentium D CPU, which this motherboard has under this rather large heatsink, although it's there for purpose, not for show. This has a 2.66 gigahertz Pentium D CPU underneath an LGA 775 socket. The 805 is not too terribly special, but it does have the VTX technology going for it, so not too terrible, I guess. Uh, this system can take up to the Pentium D 960 CPU, as this was before the Core 2 architecture was standardized in the industry. The Core 2 was out at the time, although I think it was just the Core Duo and was only really being used exclusively in the higher-end machines such as the higher-end Optiplexes, the higher-end Apple Macs, although that soon became a later standard trend as, this, as the CPU's cost went down and so on and so forth. But the Pentium D still lived on into the late 2000s to an extent. It was effectively just two Pentium 4s put together with duct tape, if you want to put it that way. And we have random cattage in the video, of course. So besides the uh, CPU limitations, there are a couple more limitations to this particular motherboard, which by the way is an MSI motherboard. It is the MS-7248 version 1.1, the exact same motherboard that is inside of my Gateway E2600S. The only thing different about this system is it has firewire over my system's lack of firewire. Excuse the siren noise because we live right next to the hospital. But it'll be done before I know it. Anyways, excusing the siren, the system has a RAM limitation just like the Gateway E2600S because they use the exact same motherboard. Effectively capping the system at 2 gigabytes of DDR2-667 memory. Yes, 667 megahertz memory, but only 2 gigabytes of it. That is the official limitation from MSI. However, unofficially the system does run 3 gigs of RAM. I have gotten it to work before, but I... Unfortunately, I have it in, or had that system, uh, or blah, 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 let me try this again. I had that configuration going in my E2600S. It worked fine, but I didn't keep it in there just because the motherboard had a defect with the CMOS system, and it effectively just was a trash motherboard. It still worked for the most part, but every time you unplugged the system, you had to reset the date and time, so not a real big deal, but still. And also, if you put a CMOS battery into the system, a known good CMOS battery, it would effectively stop booting. So yeah, that was the problem with the motherboard. So 
it was not worth keeping. Although this system isn't much better and you'll soon see that down there. There's one bulging capacitor down there and right down there by that coil and I'll zoom into it a little bit. There is another bulging capacitor. So that's quite nice to see, isn't it? Anywho, um, the system, I, again, I was really surprised to see what, when I got it, there was no SATA hard drive because my E2600S actually had a SATA hard drive in it when it was new. I'll have to pause for the siren, just be right back. Holy cow, they're sending out even Rescue 7? What the hell happened? Behind the IDE ports, you can see four serial ATA ports. I believe they are just SATA 1, but they are still serial ATA ports. And there are some front panel headers. And there's the main north bridge, which is an ATI IXP 450. And I believe either it, whoops, just dropped the side panel, whoops. Uh, either that or this contains the integrated graphics, which are ATI Radeon Express 200 series graphics. And, you know, they're not great, but they run the Windows XP Media Center well enough. The system actually has surround sound audio fed by this Realtek ALC861 audio codec. And the system also has FireWire, which is a leg up from my E2600S. And I don't know if this Windbond chip down here has any kind of control in that, because that Windbond chip there is the BIOS. And that Realtek chip controls the Ethernet hardware. So I'm not quite sure what this Windbond chip does down there. And um, there's also another MSI branded chip down there. I'm not sure what it does. And um, yeah, there's not a whole lot to see on this motherboard. Everything is mostly integrated and not too interesting. I believe that's also got something to do with some kind of controller. It's an RTM865T-300. So I'm not sure what that's supposed to do. And uh, there's some, there's a floppy port down there and I believe that's the low pin count IO controller underneath that sticker there. Either that or that Windbond chip does the duty. I'm not sure. Most likely this chip with a sticker on it because then on my other system that Windbond chip was not there. So yeah. This also only needs a 20 pin ATX power connector on the power supply which is also interesting because the system uses a Pentium D CPU. It's not exactly an energy efficient CPU. Of course, it does get its 4-pin power, but it's weird that there's no 24-pin ATX. So I imagine a more powerful CPU probably would throttle this system a little bit. The system also has a 300-watt power supply in it, which is interesting. Same as my E2600S small form factor. And uh, from here, I mean, there's really not too much else to say about this particular system, other than the fact that there is a card reader on the front and the optical drive. And actually, both of them seem to share a very similar looking faceplate design to E-Machines. See, this is the thing of why I can't make videos often is because I have to deal with all the going on in the house. Anyway, so as I was saying, this shares a very similar design to an E-Machine style computer. And uh, I know this because of this thick faceplate on the optical drive, which shares design cues to E-Machines. Same with this card reader which says digital media manager that also has a very similar look to e-machines i believe what gateway did after they bought out e-machines was they just recycled some of the parts that they had and they put them together to make sort of a weird case design that was gateway but also shared e-machines parts because this is something that e-machines actually did too yes but gateway kind of modified the design a little bit to kind of make it look like a gateway and not an e-machines, just to like rebadged e-machines. So there's a gateway part there, that power button, which would otherwise be an E logo right there in the middle of the case. So it's very interesting how this machine was put together and laid out. So yeah, the neighborhood is filled with noisy cars right now and noisy cats in the house. And of course everything has to go wrong when I make a video because of course it does. Anyway, the system is based off of a Pentium D805 CPU running at 2.66 gigahertz, like I said. This has one gig of RAM, it has a 250 gig hard drive, a card reader, firewire, it actually happens to have a modem, the Azure Systems Pinball P40 modem, which is obviously very dated, but it was a modem. It worked back in the day when you needed a modem because not everybody had broadband and um, this actually does have a PCI Express X16 connector, so I can actually plug in a more powerful graphics card. 
And I might tinker with that because I actually have a little AMD Radeon HD 6350 lying around that I'd actually like to try and uh, put into an XP system and see if I can make it a better system for playing some of the older DirectX 9 titles. I don't need it for anything more because of course it's very weak and it only has 512 megs of graphics memory. So it would make for a pretty interesting little DX9 based GPU for an XP build. Not too terribly powerful for the more powerful games, but you know, it still could be fun to play around with nonetheless. Checking out the I.O. on this computer, it has a 5.1 surround sound audio setup on the back, which is pretty nice to see for a media center computer. We have a 9-pin serial, parallel port, VGA, PS2 keyboard and mouse, four USB 2.0 ports, as well as 1000 Ethernet and Firewire 400 on the back. And also on the front, we also have an additional two USB ports, a Firewire port, as well as a headphone and microphone jack. All right there on the front. So, shoddy camera work out the window. Let's go ahead and connect this machine up and see what it's running for software. It's very noisy when it boots up, at least initially. One thing I have to say about this computer's audio is that it actually sounds pretty damn good by today's standards. It actually has a very nice equalization based driver that you can set and you can change the different equalization standards whether you want to introduce echo, change the pitch, um, all that sort of stuff and configure surround sound. I mean this thing is a very versatile integrated audio chipset and it sounds very good and it works quite well as well. So I cannot complain with the audio on the system. It actually would make for a decent iTunes computer if you were to install the same driver on a newer operating system like Windows 7, for example. So as you can see, it's running Windows XP version 2014 Service Pack 3. I did install the unofficial Service Pack 4 on the system, obviously, as you can see. And um, it actually works quite well. I know that the unofficial Service Pack 4 had a huge performance impact on my HP A1477C, and so I do plan on redoing the software on that computer at some point because it is very slow, even with only 4 gigs of RAM and a SATA hard drive and uh, a dual core processor that's probably more powerful than this Pentium D as it sits, it's still much slower. So I do plan on redoing the service packs on that system to improve the performance because this is a much more improved version of the service pack which works a lot more efficiently and doesn't use nearly as much RAM, that didn't work, it doesn't use nearly as much RAM as the old one used to, I think it was like version 2 or something that I ran on that HP. But as you can see the memory usage is significantly lower and it's not doing nearly as much in the background. Then again this is a much lighter software load on this system, there's not as much going on and uh, maybe that's why the HP is so slow even with 4 gigabytes of RAM. I mean it's incredible at how slow that system is. So, going into the start menu to look at some of the programs in here, um, we do have America Online 9. I don't know if it works, I'm not going to bother with it in this video. But as you can see, we got all this stuff right here. We also have Power to Go and Power DVD, which are both equally as useful. And this does allow for DVD playback inside of Windows Media Center. We'll check that out here in a little bit. Oops, wrong menu. Uh, I cannot work the start menu today with arrow keys. Uh, the games section is just basically, uh, whoops, this is, I'll just use the mouse, screw the keyboard. The games are just the standard Windows XP games, um, gateway documentation. Let's take a look at the hardware reference just because I'm curious to see. This does have Adobe Reader 7. I have not bothered to update it, but it doesn't really matter. And a uh, very nice PDF. You can just scroll through this. It's got the gateway logo. I think this is something you could print out if you chose to do that. It's basically like a little um, service manual in a sense, letting you understand the motherboard. Where's the page button at? I don't think this, <laughs> yeah, it's down here, okay. So we can actually take a look at this. So you can see there's an overview. There could have been a higher end model, even higher end than this one, which would have had two Firewire ports on the front. And uh, there's a blank page, I guess. And there could have been a model with a floppy drive or dual optical drives, like I mentioned, dual Firewire ports. And uh, I mentioned stuff that you can plug into the different ports on the system. 
on the rear, what could have been ordered with the system? You could have gotten an additional video card as well as a TV tuner and uh, yeah. yeah, and then this one apparently does not have the serial port. Mine has the serial port, which is interesting. I'm not sure. I guess that must have been a higher end model that ditched the serial port. So that's interesting. I guess it must have been in favor of the modem or something. I'm not really sure. Of course, we're an ES or warning about ESD and do anything like that. You know, protect yourself. Oh, strange! Look at this. There is a model which has optical audio on the motherboard. Huh. Very interesting. So there's lots of different configurations of the GT series. There could have even been one with four DDR2 RAM slots, as you can clearly see. And uh, that picture actually did a pretty good job of representing the accurate sort of cable management that you got back in the day. So, very interesting. They didn't even have the shroud over the CPU fan. Interesting. I did actually create the recovery ISOs, as you can see. Now, this actually has software that can create ISOs. We'll get to that in a little bit. I'll show you what I mean. Google Desktop, I'm probably just going to leave that alone. It's not useful. Um, Microsoft Digital Image Starter Edition 2006. Sure, we can check that out. I've never opened it before, but we can go ahead and uh, give it a look-see here. And uh, just open the Starter Edition. And, of course, cats are getting on stuff, so I'll be right back. My apologies for all the jump cuts in this video. I was not planning on it being this jump cutty, but what can you do? This is our house in a nutshell. It's been this way for a while now, so it's been very difficult, if not impossible, to try to get a video and actually have it work out because of so many cats in this house. But I digress. Anyway, um, import pictures. I don't have any like pictures on this computer. I do have an old Samsung digital camera, and I also have an old Kodak digital camera, this DX4330, so maybe we might experiment with that at a later date if anybody's interested. But for now, uh, we're just gonna go ahead and hit close on this, and uh, as you can see, this program came out in late 2005, most likely, and uh, products made with this, that including copyrighted material, may not be soldered, you know, obviously all that stuff. So, I imagine that could be very useful. I think I even have that um, I even have a higher end version of this program on disk or something. Of course this has Office, I believe this is Home and Student 2003, I'm not sure. It could be Office Standard 2003, I can't remember. Well, so let's see. This is Office Standard for Students and Teachers 2003. So a little different, but not too far off. But effectively this is um, a slightly dumbed down version of Office 2003. It doesn't have the fancy blue user interface that Office 2003 has. Although I think that's actually a theme. I'm not sure, but I'm not sure where you would actually change that. Uh, I'm not sure if there's like some kind of theme that you could do. Apparently you can do an unfold animation. I wonder what that's like. Oh, it's like the old Windows 98 style animation or something like that. Whoops, wrong button. What else you can do with this? Obviously, you get the slide and the fade. Of course, we all know the slide is from the old Windows version, so that's very cool that they give you the choice. I like that. Um, but I'm just not sure why the blue user interface is not up here, but I'm not complaining. So yeah, we have Office 2003. And we also have Office... not Office, Works. I believe this is Works 8.5 or 9. Not sure what version this is. I guess we'll find out. Because this is new enough that it could actually be um, Works 9, but it also could be just Works 8. I'm not sure. Works 8.5. Okay. That was close. I, I, did, I did say 8.5, so I was pretty much on the money. MSN and Carta Plus. This was when Microsoft and Carta was merged into the MSN brand because it was going internet-based. And then, of course, Encarta no longer exists. So let's see what happens. Oh, it's actually a website link. I wonder what it pulls up today. Eh, nothing, because the web page doesn't exist anymore. Well, that sucks. I guess Microsoft doesn't care about Encarta anymore to actually leave the website up. Either that or it doesn't work in Firefox. I'm not sure which. I don't really care. Of course, you have Napster. I wonder what that looks like. I bet you that's another web link, because, of course, it doesn't open up its own program. Now, oh, oh, it is a program. Holy crap. What do you know? It actually does exist. Napster, for those who don't know, was effectively like the iTunes of today, but back in the day. Um, this is the program that you went online and you streamed your internet radio or you bought music from their database and you actually had it on your computer. 
and then you could put it on to devices that could play mp3s or wavs or something like that you know all the audio formats of the 2000s i don't even know if this program is actually compatible with the napster service i think napster is still around i'm not quite sure sure put it in that folder i'm on a uh, higher end network yes 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 i believe this is based on internet explorer 6 so the interface is not probably able to work as well as you would expect it to and of course it's probably stuck on this window here um, but yeah it does look as if um, Napster does still exist in a former fashion so you probably could actually start a trial of Napster but I don't care enough to really want to do that so we'll just uh, leave that alone for now there's another thing about it so yes Napster does still seem to exist nowadays but uh, I think this client would be way too old to work with it. What version of Napster even is this? Yes, oh my god. All the different script errors. Uh, let's see, about Napster. What do we got? Napster version 3.0.3.7. Copyright 2005. I actually wonder what the latest version of Napster would be if you were to try to find the latest dedicated client. I'm not sure if they actually still have something like that for Windows. So that could be very interesting to check out. But, uh, is there any kind of like check for updates button or anything like that? Maybe update Napster? Oh, you have to sign in to use the update feature. So, uh, at the moment, no. Maybe as a joke, I might make a Napster account just as a trial. And I might try that feature out and see if it works. Obviously, I'm not going to use Napster. I purchase all my music legitimately off iTunes. And, uh, I use Pandora and Spotify free versions on the side. So, well, technically, I do have Amazon Prime Music because I have a stupid Echo. But, what do you what do you expect? I mean, everybody has one of them damn things anyway. We have QuickTime Player 6. I don't know what version of QuickTime Player 6, but it's definitely some kind of QuickTime 6. Got that old classic QuickTime interface with the old style look. 6.5, copyright 2004. Not bad. I imagine, um, needs to know your internet speed. Ooh, I did not set that up. Uh, this is a 1.5 meg LAN. So that's pretty good. Let's try it again. This computer may be having trouble accessing the internet or the server may be offline. Probably because they don't update QuickTime 6 any longer. <laughs> Ooh, goodness. Real Player. Ooh, everybody's favorite program from back in the 2000s. Uh, Real Player, for those who don't know, was a way to play many different me uh, media formats that were proprietary to the real networks at the time. And it also featured its own sort of network that you could buy things from. However, they came in the proprietary real format, so you had to use this awful player. And uh, we're just going to go ahead and exit out of this. <laughs> exit out of the registration thing. I believe real network still exists today. Back then, it was kind of like the quick time for Windows, but not really. Um, real player is not the default player for one or more supported media types. Ooh, I'm going to just say no for that because media player 10 exists. Um... What version of Real Player even is this? This is Real Player 8 Basic. Build 6.0.9.584. Copyright 2000. Wow. <laughs> um, I don't know if Real Network still exists today. I mean, we can try clicking this Real Network link and see if it loads in Firefox. We'll find out. I don't know. Well, apparently this particular link does not work, but they still seem to have a website, so that's interesting. Although I'm not really too interested in the real network sort of thing to actually care too much. Uh, what else is on this thing? Oh yeah, the system recovery. So this is the program I used, which was this create my drivers and application CD. And I used this create ISO function right there. Now of course, you can set where you want to make your ISOs and you can create them. And it worked quite well, because as you can clearly see, there they are. Now, later on, I'm not sure if it'll actually let me do this, but maybe later on I can dink around with those ISOs in a virtual machine and maybe I can get a uh, gateway Windows XP virtual machine going. I don't know. It could be fun. I don't know. Depends on what you might think of that sort of thing. And, of course, the cats are being dumb, as always, because they like to use my room as a high-traffic location, even though I've spanked them multiple times and told them no. They don't listen. Anyway, there's some uh, digital media enhancements. Uh, there's Adobe Reader... Uh, Microsoft Money 2006. Oh, yes, this glorious program. Back before banks did their online databasing, uh, this is what you would have used 
back in the day with major banking to uh, keep track of your finances and such, this is what you would have used. Of course, this software nowadays is completely obsolete. It's been made obsolete because most banks uh, have their own online interfaces that you can browse using the, the internet on your computer or apps on your phone. But this is what you would have used back in the day. And we all agree to that sort of stuff. So yeah, this is what you used to do. You used to put this in and accept all this stuff. Hotmail or MSN email address, ooh, fancy. Um, but this software, like I mentioned many times, is completely obsolete nowadays, so you don't really need it. I did like the opening sound, that was quite nice. Uh, let's see, what else is on here? Oh yes, Media Player 10. This does have Media Player 10, although with the service packs, it did get updated to Media Player 11, but this system, when it was new, did come with with uh, Windows Media Player 10, which I honestly like the, the interface more compared to Inter uh, Internet Explorer, <laughs> oh, Media Player 11. It just has a much nicer interface, in my opinion. And then, last but not least, the good old Windows XP Media Center. Let's bask in the glory of the old startup sound of Media Center. <laughs> I love that sound effect. Even though I never really did get to grow up with an XP Media Center, I did actually get to see one in the wild back in the late 2000s when this was still common. And I remember this exact interface because it had this green accented button and uh, the same sound effects and everything of that resort. But yes, I actually did see a Media Center laptop in the wild. I think it was owned by one of our family members too. I doubt they have it anymore. But uh, this is, honest to goodness, Windows Media Center. And you can see the classic 2000s interface that was shared across from, oh God, even Windows Phone had that sort of interface where the the heading was in the background like that. Um, of course, that's not for this video, but you know, but yeah, we'll go and check this out. It is update rollup two version 5.1.2715.3011. I think that is actually the version number of XP, not the version number of the program. Either way, as you can see, Pentium D 2.66 gigahertz, one gig of RAM, although 128 megs of the video memory is shared for graphics, so you don't quite get one gig, but Eh, whatever. Let me go see if I can find a DVD that won't exactly get me flamed for copyright. And I'll be right back. Ah, uh, yes. We'll test it with X-Men 1.5, because, of course, nobody really watches this stuff. Of course, this is still a Marvel-based program, so I'm not going to play too much of it, because, obviously, this could still be picked up in the copyright system. But it'll just let me show you guys the DVD playback long enough to show you the interface and how it works and all that stuff. So, uh... Anyway, let's go ahead and uh, get this out with my professional camera work here. Ooh, the feature is here. Trust a few. Fear the rest, because of course. Um, so let's go ahead and pop disk one into the disk drive, which is beige, funny enough. You can see how thick the faceplate is on that optical drive. I believe it hit the play DVD button. So, let me turn my light off and then we can take a look at this. So now we wait for the disc to spin up. You can see the unique loading symbol of Classic Media Center. And ooh, FBI warning. I like that pop-out animation that Media Center does. When you, um, when you press the button, it makes a pop-out animation. I really like that. It looks so modern, so clean. But as you can see, it's playing the movie just fine, or at least it's going to. Yeah, 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 get out of this stuff. The interface looks very reminiscent of Media Player 10. If I can get it to focus there, there we go. So you get volume controls, channel controls, all that stuff. So uh, hopefully the volume's not too terribly loud. Oh yeah, good old 20th Century Fox. Actually, the volume is very quiet. The volume is all the way up on this, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yeah, there you go. Special features. Let's go into the. Uh, let's go to the special features. Why not? Enhanced viewing mode and commentary and uh, apparently a Lucasfilm THX optimizer. Ooh, this ought to be interesting. Let's try a video test. Hmm, that's exciting. <laughs> well, there we go. Um, 
this is the DVD. Um, I'm going to skip back here, I think. Is there anything exciting about this? No, it's not. So let's go back to the start menu and uh, we'll eject this. Actually, got to press stop on the button down here and then uh, you have to press eject. And unfortunately, this is an optical drive. You have to bang to open, so that kind of sucks, but it does work. So there you go. There is good old Windows XP Media Center. So that, that basically wraps up all the software that is on this computer. There's not too much else to show other than the fact that I put on Firefox and installed the updates. So I guess for now, this is um, it for the GT4024. So uh, we'll go ahead and uh, shut it down. And there you have it. So thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you all in the next video.